The journey to building a unique Airbnb from the ground up begins with a realtor who knows land. How powerful would it be to leverage 35 years of real estate experience to choose the right one? This is my realtor. Tony. He's going to share his decades of experience in this single video. And you don't want to miss one bit because at the end, he shares the most important nugget you'll need as you begin your unique Airbnb construction process. The first problem to solve isn't just finding a realtor. It's finding the right realtor. It's easy to think that any realtor with experience in buying homes will be good at buying raw land. But listen to Tony describe the kind of realtor that can help investors not just buy raw land, but buy the right piece of property in the right location for a unique luxury Airbnb. To identify the right type of, of realtor, one that has expertise and knowledge and principally land. So the question isn't if you need a realtor, it's how to find a realtor with deep expertise in buying land. Here's Tony explaining exactly how to find the right realtor and listing specific steps to take. You can go online and you can research agents, you can interview agents, and you can search for agents that have specialty experience or expertise in, I would say, in land, land development, zoning entitlements, understanding how to navigate through the processes that will be required to go from site acquisition to approval to final development. Tony also understands the mindset entrepreneurs need when searching for land, especially when they want to build unique short-term rentals, which may be restricted to certain zones and types of structures. You know, having that no quit, no, no, I'm going to mm -hmm. find the, I'm going to find the yes. I'm going to work with, mm -hmm. whether it's zoning or health department or whoever, I'm going to work within those areas of government that I need to, but then also finding the right agency or municipality or county, you know, government that's receptive, um, mm -hmm. that says, yeah, we welcome this in our area and we will work with you. They won't all do that. So, you know, I think it's a little bit of a combination of both of those factors. If you were paying attention, Tony also describes the type of location that's a fit for unique luxury Airbnbs. Figuring out if your project will be approved becomes much easier when you find the right type of seller. You know, not every seller is or owner of a property is going to be patient and allow you as a buyer to have time to study a property. Like you can't just buy a property and say, okay, I'm going to do what I want to do with it. Right. Especially when you're changing the use or you're establishing a use like what you're, you're proposing you have to go through an entitlement process. And that, that could take, you know, anywhere from two to nine months, depending on where you are and what you need to do to the property, whether it's drill well or get a septic approval or get a zoning variance or whatever the issue might be. And, until you go through that process, you know, at, at some point you'll know that you can get to the finish line, but there are checkpoints along the way. And, you know, to safeguard your investment and your and your risk, mitigate your risk factor, you need to build in contingencies in your contract. And that's a very delicate and sophisticated and challenging thing to negotiate back to having the right realtor involved. You know, you need a realtor that understands how to put an, in, a, in a contract together that allows their client, in this case, you, my buyer, to have those safeguards and those check mark along the way, those opportunities to have the approvals. Having enough time to learn if your project can be built is crucial because you're installing things like roads, sewage pipes, and electricity for the first time. Each local government will require these systems to meet their own standards. In the area where I am working right now, probably the number one thing to overcome is, is dealing with the health department and dealing with the septic capacity requirements. There's still not that clarity from the health department, you know, as the health department director told us, you know, that's something that eventually could become a dwelling unit. So I'm gonna treat it as a dwelling unit. We're like, no, 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 no. We wanna just have one master septic area that we could use for, you know, five or six or seven sites. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that we would have ever gotten there with the local health department. Reflecting on Tony's caution, I describe our particular challenge in getting our luxury build approved. Our property doesn't have septic or sewage challenges, but we do have road issues. You never know what a given county is going to say and what they're going to, I guess, nitpick about. You know, one county, it might be septic, like the county where we started. Septic was the thing. Yeah. Where I'm at, it's roads because I'm I'm on fairly undeveloped land that has this road that has been there for quite some time, but it's not paved. 
and it's not recorded in all parts of of the county, wherever that's recorded. So they may make us put in that road. What your local government will require depends on two things. The first is your vision for the project. For example, how many structures do you want to build? Will they be permanent, wood built, or temporary canvas structures? How many visitors will you host in a day or a year? All of these details will impact the second thing, what the county will require for your intended use of the land in its particular area. Let's listen to Tony describe how this could play out for you as you begin to get permission from your local government for your project. Off-site improvement, you know, that that one, you might remember the one property, the cabin over the Marzal area. That one, I was sure that that road was going to need to have some improvement if you were going to get into doing anything, intensifying the use. And that's pretty common these days. A lot of municipalities, and people don't realize that, you know, you're buying a property here and you're going to be told that, you know, well, there's an intersection that's failing two miles down the road. It has nothing to do with your property, but it's in, in the area that services your property And there may be an escrow account already established with money that you might have to put into that escrow to upgrade that intersection. Or in your case, an improvement to a road. Ultimately, you're going to benefit from that. So you're going to get some Mm -hmm. value out of that. But Mm -hmm. it's also, you know, roads are not cheap. So it's it's something you may not have budgeted for in your project. And that's the kind of thing that you want to try to flush out during a due diligence period. Try to understand what the economic impact of that's going to be so that you can you know, decide whether or not the project can carry itself. I mean, at the end of the day, as much as you love this, you want this to be a profitable venture. You can't go upside down out of the gate spending too much money on development. A huge mistake entrepreneurs make is reasoning by analogy. They think there is a match between what the law says is allowed and what they want to build. But many entrepreneurs don't understand that laws are just a set of organized ideas until they are applied to specific facts and circumstances. This applied reasoning involves speaking with local government officials to get their guidance on what they will and will not allow. Tony describes the process of applied reasoning as due diligence. In general, I think you probably want to have somewhere between a five to ten thousand dollar due diligence budget uh, minimum. And and I think the major things that you want to hit on during your due diligence and this due diligence provision, you know, that sometimes referred to as a feasibility study could be a minimum of 30 days or as long as 90 days, depending on how complex the site is. And the things that you want to check off the list, the big ones are zoning. You know, is this a permitted use by right? In other words, you can just apply for it and do it, or is it permitted? And then you have to get a site plan approval where you have to then go before a commission to get approval, but it's still a by right use, or is it a special exception use where you have to go to a board of zoning appeals, get a special exception for the use, then go to the planning commission to get the site plan approval. Then you can go to your construction. Those are all things that you'll want to determine during due diligence, as well as, you know, to the best ability possible, you want to try to monetize and qualify the time and the expense that it's going to take you to go through that process involving, you know, a land planner and or an engineer to help you navigate through that. Here are the specific questions you need to ask during this phase. Is it a property that's serviced by well water or available to a municipal water system? Is it a property that's serviced by a private septic system or available to hook up to public sewer system? If it's private septic system, you know, a lot of times septic systems are approved and they're only approved for residential dwellings and they're rated based on residential dwelling capacities. This sort of crosses over into a commercial arena as we experienced, and there aren't too many guidelines that are clear about exactly what health departments are looking for. That's, I'm going to say that's probably the biggest one to to nail down, at least in the central Maryland region right now. The health department is all over the place and they do not like private septic systems. They really want folks to go more into public sewer systems. And basically, I think the attitude of the health department is that all septic systems are going to fail if they're not already failing and they're going to contaminate the aquifer and they just don't like them. 
Using the applied reasoning method in the due diligence phase is crucial because it helps entrepreneurs understand how much the land development will cost. The roads, driveways, electricity, sewage, and plumbing for water will all have costs that depend on the land itself and whether these systems can be connected to what the local government provides or if they must be done privately because they are too far away from the government infrastructure system. Let's listen to Tony describe the questions entrepreneurs need to answer to better understand what the cost could be for their particular project. You would want to explore, depending on the site, is the actual site development costs themselves. You know, is it a site that's going to need roads, either on-site or off-site? Is it a site that's going to need clearing and grading? And that gets you into a whole nother arena of permitting issues. If you mm -hmm. typically, if you start clearing more than 5,000 square feet in most areas, then you get into a major grading permit. And now you might be introducing other variables like stormwater management ponds and mm -hmm. things like that. So it can get pretty tricky. Um, fortunately, I think for what you're, what you're doing and how you're developing it and really synergizing this with nature, I mean, at the end of the day, you're not clearing trees and you're not looking to, you know, pave over and turn it into parking lots and, and hotels. It's, it's, you know, it's intended to be harmonious with nature. So relatively low economic or e environmental impact, which is, mm -hmm. um, which is good uh, for, um, in terms of keeping costs down. The next part of the applied reasoning phase is to draft a site plan. At this point, you're mapping out where all of your structures will go, where the parking, roads, electricity, sewage, and plumbing pipes will be located. You'll need to plan your site according to the local government requirements. The site plan is a document that will become part of your permitting application for your overall project. So it's it's kind of a blend, like, you know, as, as you're, I'm thinking about some of the sites that we looked at, you know, and what we would do, you know, we'd go into the GIS systems and we'd look at the aerial maps and, you know, we discovered along the way that there was this 25% grade rule that, um, you know, snuck up on us that you can't mm -hmm. put a driveway in, 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 in our municipality uh, or in our, in our region uh, with a 25% grade or more. The county is not allowing that anymore. So, you know, we were doing a lot of that preliminarily, but, you know, after you've identified the right site and then you bring in your land planner, then you want to map it out, right? You want to see what would this site yield in terms of the number of sites um, mm -hmm. What can I do? Where am I going to put parking? Where am I going to, where's the access going to be ro road network, uh, septic area, and, uh, you know, whether you're doing a centralized bathhouse or, or not and things like that. And all of that needs to be planned out and laid out. And then as you proceed through the process, you know, you want to see how you marry that vision up to the reality of can this site accommodate that? A simple way to think about how the due diligence and site planning phases are different is that due diligence is when you learn about the constraints of your project and site planning tests those constraints. These phases overlap a bit and both need to be complete before you receive approval to build your project. However, Tony breaks down the sequence between these phases in easy to follow steps. First thing that I would counsel anyone is you want to try to find a seller like you have that's willing to be patient and you make an offer contingent upon that due diligence study period. Give yourself enough time, you know, 60 days goes by pretty quick, but that's probably the right number, 60 days to do an initial due diligence. During that due diligence period, that's when you really get into the weeds and you really understand what the roadmap will look like to go from vision to execution. The goal of the due diligence and site planning phases is to help entrepreneurs decide to buy the property based on the allowability of a desired project. By speaking with local government officials and engineers who will map out a site, entrepreneurs will then have the confidence needed to finalize the sale of the property and proceed with the project. Here, Tony describes those next steps. Then you can further define with the seller, okay, we'll waive our due diligence. However, as we come out of due diligence, we now have these things that we need to accomplish in order to be able to settle. And that may mean at some point, you know, most sellers are going to be patient to a point, but they're going to want you to put up some earnest money deposit. And some of it might be at risk, meaning you might have to walk away from your, almost think of it like an option fee. You might have to say, look, I'll pay you, you know, 5000 or $10,000 to hold this. Give me the time to get to settlement. If I don't, it's yours. But if I do, I want credit for that deposit. 
against my purchase price. At least then the seller is going to feel like, okay, well, they're serious. They're committed to this. And I get something out of it if they don't buy my property. And I understand that they can only buy my property if they get the approvals that they need. So, you know, you don't want to go spend a whatever quarter million dollars and buy a property and, and then figure out, you know, you can't do anything or you can't do what you would like to do in terms of uh, developing a glamping, a glamping site. So mm-hmm. that's, that's, tough to negotiate in a market where you have very little inventory and it's a very strong seller's market, which is what it has been in my area for going on a decade now. Here's Tony's most valuable insight into the right type of realtor to have by your side throughout this process, because the journey is ultimately about solving problems. Through the lens of problem solving, Having a realtor who will be sensitive to what the neighbors and local community leaders will say about your project is important because their opinions could make or break the project. You know, there's there's yes. all of this like uncertainty of like we experience, you know, well, oh my gosh, we don't want that in our neighborhood. And, and you know, we heard that a little bit at the auction, like, oh my God, no, I wouldn't want that here. And yep. And the county and the county's perception when you find a site and then you have to go to a hearing and the neighbors come out and it's a wild card and the neighbors could come out in a, in a board of zoning appeals hearing and protest and the board of zoning appeals commissioners are humans and they're probably neighbors of the people mm-hmm. coming out. They live in the area. If you're not from that area, they may not look favorably on what you want to do, even if it's a good thing. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a wild card that. You don't know until you go through that process as to whether or not that's something that can get approved. Not all communities are right for this because you are kind of t- turning an area into a tourist location, a, a vacation location, and some communities don't want it. And I would say if you want to save yourself the time and the aggravation, move on. Find a place that's going to to welcome this. Here's where to find Tony if you'd like to work with him. Tony C at VCRE.co, 301-471-TONY. I'm in downtown Frederick, uh, the center of the universe. We are the apex of the triangle between D.C. and Baltimore. I'm centrally located in Maryland and I service all of Maryland, but principally Frederick County. That's that's my playground. I love, love the opportunity to hear from any of your viewers, um, but more importantly, I'm persevere and move forward. I'm anxious as you are. And I know you're going to get to the finish line. Wish you all the best. Thank you again for the invite. Tony and I sincerely hope you found this video helpful. Thanks for watching.